Hello and welcome to another episode of Dream Nation. I'm your host, Yulia. We are now 4,000 people strong, not counting the Android subscribers. I haven't figured out how to do that, so I have a feeling we're over 5,000. I love doing the show every month. I'm really excited to share it with you. Please share it with your friends, post it on social. And um, on this show, I am interviewing Paul Berry, who also goes by Andrea Berry. And Andrea recently launched a new website called Fluidity Love. It's a company distributing narratives for people who, like him, are gender fluid. Now, I identify as gender fluid, but not in the way that you might think. So I'm not traditionally gender fluid, but I do have two very dominant sides that I embrace and I don't really talk about. And um, I love being human and I love being able to tap into all the richness that I have inside of me, that all of us have inside of us. And this podcast really opens up a really great conversation about that. And uh, you might also know Andrea as the former chief technical officer of Huffington Post. After HuffPost sold to AOL in 2011, Andrea went on to found Rebel Mouse. And that platform helps media companies and brands reach their target communities through social media. They've raised over $23 million from investors and they work with brands like Paper Magazine and The Dodo. I'm a former paper intern. I love paper. You're going to hear all about that later on on the show. And it's no surprise that Andrea and I have a paper connection. If you haven't checked out Paper Magazine, you really should. They're very progressive. And uh, I love them. They're independent. They break the internet. The art direction is awesome. The content is really great. And they're very progressive. And they're like us. So uh, shout out to Paper and uh, Mikey and Drew and everybody there. And um, Andrea previously built Avaz.org and before that was the CTO of Chartermac, a real estate finance company that was market cap at 4.5 billion at the time. You know, just 4.5 bill, no biggie. And um, Andrea was also the VP of uh, Internet for Palo Alto Software, where she built bplans.com and the e-commerce business of paloalto.com. Most importantly, Andrea was the co-founder of thedogisland.com, which is oh something else I can talk about forever because we're both vegan and we, we love animals. So, But that's another story. I'm so excited for this podcast because I really, really admire Andrea, and I think that Andrea is a genius Andrea is a next level human all around. It's just such an honor to be able to sit down and talk about technology and talk about gender. So uh, let's get to the show and uh, let's hear Andrea talk instead of me. Enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, we're here with Paul Berry and he's from Fluidity Love and we have a lot of questions about diversity and uh, technology and startups and like pretty much everything. Yes, so so happy to be on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in. I'm looking to see who's tuning in. All right, it's a little quiet. It's 3.30 on a Monday, but that's how we roll. (laughs) (laughs) So my first question to you is, what was your dream as a kid? Oh, wow. Um, I, I am a dreamer, for sure. So I think that... Um, I've always allowed myself to have many, many dreams. And I think one of them was always to be a writer. And I'm really proud of the writing that I do, but also working with writers. Um, Another one, I've always loved animals. Mm -hmm. Having been able to work on the dodo, which is now by far the largest animal site, was amazing. Um, I wanted to work for National Geographic. That has never panned out. Yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see. One day. (laughs) Well, you know what I also realized? I'm vegan, too. Oh, wow. So we're both vegan. I went vegetarian when I was 12. Sorry, I did that. I can talk about (laughs) veganism and animals all day long. So how did you get into technology? So you were into animals? I um, Well, I grew up in Palo Alto in the Silicon Valley, and my dad started a software company after being a journalist. So I started writing code. I remember the first reason, I I started writing code when I was very little, like 10. Um, And the first reason was, my mom is Mexican. I'm Mexican, I I, I was born in Mexico City. My dad's American. But um, the first code I wrote was just password protecting a text file. 
and in a way like my mom could never get, we could never have a diary that was private. And this was my first private space. Because you're also in a Mexican family and everything yeah, is safe. It's nice. all, and it's we, all. I have four sisters, and it was, there was no private space. I'm and, Russian, and, like, <laughs> and my boyfriend is Native American, and he's like, do you understand? Face. And I'm like, no, I am Russian. You don't understand. Like, we have no boundaries. We have no, you know? Yes, that's what I grew up in. So technology became, in many ways, the ability for me to discover private spaces, but to build them as well. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, we have to create these private spaces, and that's kind of what you're doing right now with Fluidity Love. Yeah, so <clears throat> for me, I spent... As a, as a kid, I had, and I've always had, a feminine identity, but I learned to hide it and cover it. Um, I, there was lots of little things that you remember. Um, my posture one day, and a friend yelled, he's standing like a girl. I love that posture. And I learned to stop doing that posture, but I, Besides from covering it up, I couldn't stop it because it's who I am. So it was just this year that finally my wife and I have uh, four kids now. We've been married 12 years. So it was 11 years in that I finally was able to tell her about it. And I had been like going on business trips and I'd buy cute things at H&M and take pictures. And I was so paranoid of being found, I would throw things away in the dumpster, like to not connect, like someone could connect the dots. So everything that I was super ashamed of, as I've come out with telling it, so, you know, for, for my wife, it was very important to me that she understand. I hid it from her in part because I thought she'd find it unattractive. And I, and I told her, like, it can't do it with you and have that be a part if it's unattractive for you. Everything I feared has just been fear. It turned out to be so fun and sexy and hot and you're married for so long and there's this depth to us as humans. And that is, that is the really fascinating, fun thing of meeting each other and having a safe space between two people. And so for once we had the door locked, the kids didn't know about this, um, and we had a fear around the kids. That was so wrong to fear it. The kids love my maternal side. They love the feminine side. It's brought us together so, so closely. And the reason that I started Fluidity.Love is Rebel Mouse is the parent company. And I'm very dedicated to Rebel Mouse. We're doing really well. It's very exciting. It's about having an impact on how ideas change culture and being able to power incredible sites like Paper Magazine and Pop Matters and Azula and OK Africa and just an incredible portfolio. But nobody was talking about gender fluidity. And nobody was talking about the systematic suppression of feminine attributes in humans, and especially boys, where it's a third rail. And if it's okay, tomboys are much more accepted, though the struggle that a trans man has is real, very real. Tomboys are more accepted. It's um, very, I'm a very confusing person in society now because they think at first, well, okay, so he's really gay. But then they see me with the kids, and it's like, what? And then they see my wife kiss me, and then it's like, oh, wait. This is, and then what I realized why it's important for us to be doing this is that <clears throat> in private, millions of men feel like I do. And they started to message me as I told my story and say, I'm terrified to tell my girlfriend. I'm terrified to tell my wife. I'm so scared what will happen at work. Um, it seems that the more macho the environment, the more there's this desire to express femininity because I think it's the nature of our human soul. And the definition of what a guy is is far too thin for many of us. How many, how much that is? Is it tens of millions or hundreds of millions or billions? I'm not sure of yet. but. Um, it's been, for me, the mission is to help. I spent 11 years hiding something from my wife that would have brought us together. There was no reason to hide it. But there were no narratives to discuss it. 
And so transparent is kind of like one of the only narratives. But that has, that's not me. I wasn't leaving her. I, I love our, her and the family, my kid, like what we have here. And, and so it's not just my narrative, but a lot of non-binary narratives that no longer fit into the rigid roles that we see as options for ourselves in life. Society is just so focused on putting everybody in these boxes. Yeah. And our society is just so rich. Yeah, and we are as humans, and the ability to find who you are should be a parent's number one. That's our role, is to help them find who they are and support them in being that. And so I am very excited that I think in our lifetime we're going to be able to see some changes um, that are like thousands of years in the making for us to move from rigid roles. Fluidity for me is also about um, how you work your talents, your creativity. In the past, you could be a secretary, learn someone's calendar, and do that for 45 years. But that will be automated. And so what makes us human can never be automated. And that's that creativity. And most of the beautiful inventions in the world and discoveries are made from someone taking a pivot from their main focus was biology, and then they started to do something else. And so. Uh, I think we have to be fluid in borders. I don't think it's fair to humanity to have rigid borders. We see so much unnecessary death. So we're, we're on this path where we needed rigid roles at first, but we no longer need them, and they're like armor. And it's like literally trying to show up in 2017 with an, an armor from the 1300s. Um, so, but it's very confusing to people. Um, for sure, and there's millions of kids who feel comfortable doing this, but society's not really ready for it. So a big part of fluidity is training. Um, individuals in HR, they're like now liable to understand this in the current workforce, and they need safe spaces to ask clumsy questions. And so that's what we're doing with the certification process for individuals to say, I understand gender inclusion and gender diversity and what it means, and I can talk about it and deal with it, but also for companies. So a company that has any consumer-facing impact, it's really amazing the opportunity and, again, the liability right now. When I go shopping and I, I, all of my friends that are trans or non-binary, we all go through this. Of It's either a terrible dysphoric experience where you're treated in a way that makes you feel awful and you never want to see that store or label or name again. Or you leave like literally hugging the other person, like it's an incredible, so it's a, it's a chance for people um, to create new, you know, uh, new customers, new connections that are very meaningful as we figure out who we are. And like for me, buying boy clothes was so boring. I never wanted to. And it was just the minimum. But it turns out when you let people like me start to buy the things that we really wanted, suddenly it's a totally different consumer behavior. I think we have to start treating everybody as just humans as opposed to just gender roles. Like if yes. you're like, well, what do you want to do? I, as a girl, like I always wear black and I never really got dressed up because I would get a lot of attention, especially as a young woman. Yeah, yeah. So I learned to suppress my own sexuality because it put me into dangerous positions all the time. So here yeah. I am wearing black people <laughs> Steve Jobs being a tech geek because I was also in very masculine environments. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Where like if I stayed at work at two o'clock in the morning, there would be some creative director giving me a back rub <laughs> that I did not want. And I never I'm sorry. I'm but sorry, like, that's not women, even funny. You know? It's so horrible. And so. I really worry about um, it's, we're, we're realizing that it's systematic, it's not mm -hmm. exceptions. It's literally out for my two daughters and, and my two sons like to understand my two daughters have like 100% certainty of going through an abusive circum situation. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, it leads me to believe men are broken as a category that they can't understand because they are so ashamed of their own femininity they can't understand femininity at all. And so what the locker room talk is all they get 
And so I used to act as a translator growing up in high school for my friends because I had four sisters and I was very attuned to So I would see them be so clumsy and do things that were like unintentionally hurtful. But they had no idea. And it's like society's not teaching our kids what we need them to know. And that's where Fluidity Love comes in, because I think it's a really great platform to create that awareness. Speaking back to those private spaces where you can learn in the privacy of your own home, too. Yeah, I think that share. mixture of understanding the stories, what we want to do is help people understand the stories of who we can be as humans, the options you have. You know, it's, uh, I remember seeing Ellen DeGeneres uh, when I was a little girl, you know, in Disney World and Epcot Center. And it was a new, like, you, we can be like that. And there's so much more that we can be than the options that we're given right now. So part of it is creating those narratives, but part of it is also starting to create the, the frameworks for people to be supportive. As I've come out, I've realized, like, oh my god, how confusing it is for everyone else. And this includes my wife, you know, my employees at Romas, my investors. Like, everyone is confused about gender non-binary issues. And so, um, one of the things that I've found personally is that when the reaction is right, and you're in a good state, then it can become a very sweet connection. Well, um, <clears throat> one way to think about it is my identity impacts my wife's identity. And the concept of like a trans lesbian was no, something I didn't even know existed until a few years ago. That would have blown my mind as a teenager. It's like you want to be a girl, but you don't. It's not because you want to be with guys. You want to be a girl as a girl, like lesbian girl. It's like not... And it's, uh, it's, there's so many narratives that are possible to, uh, to fit, but this, the having safe spaces to ask these questions too and be able to understand, you know, what are the options on how you react to someone. Because as I've come out, some people have been very clumsy in their reactions to it, and I've realized frameworks for people to understand how to react. I was questioning, how do I introduce you? I was like, well, everybody knows you as Paul Berry. So I'm like, hey, I'm interviewing Paul Berry on the show. But then I'm like, well, he's going by Andrea. But if I post Andrea, nobody's going to know who Andrea is. So it's like, how do you start up the conversation? This is how yeah. you do it. You just go, so, I'm having Paul Berry. Yeah. And he's and, being fluid you love. And that, and that works for me. For Just to be very clear for everyone you know, listening, um, that isn't true for everyone, especially for people who consider themselves transgender. The norm when you've come out as transgender is you have a dead name, and that part of your past is kind of is gone. Sometimes I feel part of the transgender community in general, but um, being gender fluid, the way I am, makes me a little bit different in that I don't have a dead name. I worked really hard on Ballberry, and I was also not. It was, for me, being a boy wasn't a miserable experience. It just was so much less than who I am. So I do like to be called Andrea, as you know, but I worked hard on the name of Paul Barry. So my next question leads into media and distribution with yeah. Rebel Miles. I'm also a former paper intern. I love paper, and I'm so excited about their digital sale. Yeah, They sold, and they're so successful. and. They're brilliant, and shout out to Mikey and the staff and, and Kim. And, and Drew and Tom and Kim and David, absolutely. Yeah, I want to try to get Kim and David on my podcast this year, too, because oh. they were just... In 99, I fell in love with them because I was going to the club kids scene, and they were like my people. They're you know, to be boys. totally honest, we worked on Paper Mag for three years. I loved them all the way through, but it wasn't until I came out that I really understood what Paper Mag means to yeah. So it, it, they are lovely. They're a lovely collection of amazingly, incredibly talented, creative people. Yeah. That are just like shining a light, a beacon for all of us who are just yeah. doing our own thing and we want to share love with the world. Yeah. And it really describes why I built Rebel Mouse. I love that you picked Paper Mag as a client. Um, when they came to us, they had a website technology driving things that was going to require for them to do the redesign and rebuild from everything that was all this lunacy. They were going to have to raise another round of financing. 
And so what I love about what we can do with Rebel Mouse is by sharing right now, if every media company has a tech team, everyone's rebuilding all the same stuff. And the waste across the industry is massive at a time where the industry has no room for it. The margins are tiny. And so we were able to take Paper Mag and move them into a super modern platform that could redesign a lot. And, and we could, did that redesign for them at way less cost. We love being able to help indie publishers, but media companies in general. And we can do it because it's sort of sharing the costs. The CMS cost is split by however many clients we have, essentially. And so what it takes right now is like it takes $10 million a year to keep a website awesome. And we drastically reduce, I mean, uh, a percent of that. And uh, we get to work with amazing, amazing clients. Um, Azula is a really awesome one that's been growing like crazy as well. We love OK Africa and Pop Matters. And we also work with big brands. And I'm proud of the work we do there. United Airlines, we power hub.united. And, um, you know, we do underneath it where it, I'm a confusing person. And so the Rebel Mouse is a little bit of a confusing company in that we cover strategy and content taxonomy and how it works, as well as delivering the technology. So I found myself for a few years building Rebel Mouse in this SaaS vendor scene. Mm -hmm. Software as a surface vendors. The truth is that I don't identify with that scene at all. I hate those trade shows and those people. The real reason I built Rebel Mouse is because at HuffPost we weren't building a CMS. Jonah and I, Jonah Peretti, founder of BuzzFeed and uh, co-founder of HuffPost, had met in 2001, and he is Zay Frank and Ken Lear. Ken's the chairman of BuzzFeed, and Zay Frank runs all of video and entertainment. We were working together on launching all these projects. And underneath it, HuffPost was then when we figured all that out, HuffPost was a chance to make it less of hunting for mushrooms and more like systematic so that every story had the best chance of going viral. And <clears throat> that, when, I, when AOL acquired HuffPost, I ran product design and engineering for AOL's media properties. And I realized the CMSs had been built by people who don't understand traffic at all. Mm -hmm. They had been given a list of requests and demands, and that's what they had built. But that's what makes us different at Rebel Mouse, and we care a lot about the strategies side of it as well. Well, you know what? My next question leads into you know the new media landscape in 2018. Everything is just so different now, right? Like yeah. Even Facebook, the new speed algorithm was just Absolutely. changed like last week. Um, you know, in days where like, okay, well, Vine is no longer relevant, you know, or we have Snap, yeah. there's so many platforms. Uh, how does one connect with the right audience? Like, how can small brands create vitality with, with the right distribution, which is what you guys specialize in? Yeah, so we have a few things built into the platform that we believe are good strategies. We make it hyper-efficient to do that to every story. But what you have to think about is that regardless of the uh, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Google, every story you do, and some brands think about it content, but really you should think about it as the story. And every story you're doing should reach new audience. It's not just about reaching your current audience, it's about, and so when you, when you take a moment to understand where we are now, if you look very brief history of the internet, is that before, first there was no organization, and then Yahoo hired human category editors. And so the human category editors were everything. And if you got a little star on the top of your category, that was made business. And then Google came, and we couldn't even conceptualize something more powerful than Google's way of organizing it. And search was king. But what Facebook has done, and so it took us a while, by the way, media companies didn't understand how to do search at all. That was a huge HuffPost advantage. They still today don't know how to do search, honestly, every time I see what they're doing. Um, 
But then social came, and what Facebook has done is, people don't really fully realize it, but it's a return back to the Yahoo days. There's human category editors, but now there's 85 million of them, because Facebook with pages has made it scale. And pages, their software has been training us, are built to match, unfortunately or fortunately, the filter bubble. And what it means is like, I follow you because you keep coming back with awesome uh, Facebook lives with diverse people and it makes me really happy. So every piece of content you give back to me. Then the trick with each piece of content you produce is to find those like-minded pages and create a relationship with them. So for example, the, one, the, the company that has done this better than anyone is the Dota. It's been really funny to watch the life of the Dodo because at first nobody knew about it at all and everybody thought it was a stupid name and a stupid idea too. And it was Ken Lair, Ken Lair Izzy Lair, uh, and two of, other of us on the board as we created that company. And <clears throat> the, 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 all the same challenges that everyone faces. It's too noisy, you know, like someone's already doing that was extreme for the Dodo. But what they did is systematically with every piece of content they did is they connected all the dots in the universe of animals on the internet. So that instead of pretending to create an isolated new dot, they were the one that became the center of the universe of animal pages on the internet. And every animal page is dying to be featured by the dodo now. Because being featured by the dodo is like they have the most popular video on Facebook ever. But they did it step by step at first and creating a, an authentic relationship with the pit bull page and the itty bitty pit bull page and this and then the elephant pages and on and on. And we all have that, whether you're United Airlines and working on destinations and concepts or your power to fly. My wife's company, who's, we just did a strategy call, they're using the platform in an awesome way and finding women in tech and all the Facebook pages that relate to that and creating relationships with them. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's about developing your like um, elephant vertical, right? It's all different verticals. You know, yeah, the and you, vertical, you have the elephant. It's, yeah, and you have to have a clear reason mm -hmm. for people to want to come back. And that's the, in terms of the new Facebook algo, that's the really important thing is that we're shifting now from, in last year they proved, Facebook proved that they could drive massive traffic to this new format, which is the 30 second to 60 second social video. Mm -hmm. And that's like when you look at it with the reading, right, it has text over it, and it's like the laziest slideshow in the world. But what they've announced is after studying it, it, it is the laziest slideshow in the world, but it also makes people lazy. And it's not really valuable because it's not worth sitting through three seconds of ads for. We just leave it. Um, and so it's, there's no, and now what Facebook wants, which they radically don't, well, in a way they radically don't have, but they're using it in a way, and it's a symbol of what they don't have is Game of Thrones. Something that is like, oh my God, I'd sit through much more than three seconds of an ad to get through it. I'll go through a two minute ad to get through it and I'm dying for the next episode. So the companies that realize that you have to create conversation and engagement, you can't have just passive likes. That won't work in the new outcome. Um, and that realize that they have to give you a reason to return. The Facebook, we're seeing already in the first week of stats, it's the rewards are really clear for those. Yeah, it's really hard to monetize short video content. Impossible. It's impossible unless it's impossible. like an ad, and that's a really traditional <clears throat> way of thinking about it, and that's not a long-term strategy. Yeah. So, and it puts more pressure on creatives mm -hmm. and ad agencies creating content because you got to keep on creating them. It's yeah, well, the, the nice thing that we've seen as they move is that it's a return to writers. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, like a long, an article worth reading, really worth reading, can generate crazy revenue on Facebook in instant articles with fan is their audience network. And they're mm -hmm. at war with Google trying to own that. But mm -hmm. if you have the type of articles people just see the headline and the image and that's enough, then it's hard to monetize. But if you have the type of thing that reading the first paragraph isn't enough. You want to keep going down, that's where actually all the money is. Yeah. 
It's going to be really interesting to see where everything goes with VR and everything else in the next like 15 years. Oh my God. It's changing oh God. so fast that trying to think 15 years, 15 months is going to be like hard enough to predict. And what's clear is like the people who love change mm -hmm. are going to wake up happy. Yes. Yes, that is so true, right? If you embrace change, that is the only way you're going to enjoy life. Otherwise, it's going to be a painful experience. It's not, it's not easy to hate change in today's world. <laughs> yeah, but I have, I have so many questions, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I just have one more question, because I had all these like funding questions and everything else. What is your dream as an adult? Oh my god, my dream as an adult is much more, I mean... I have a feeling right now, and it's developed in, in a way in these last 18 months, I have a feeling that, um, you know, I always get it wrong, is it Michelangelo or Da Vinci, the, but they, it was working on the rock on the David, I, my mind is horrible uh, on these things, thank you, that. Michelangelo, and he said that it's not, he wasn't creating him, it, and he was ex discovering. He was extracting them from the And stone. just chipping away all to this, that. And so I feel I'm working on my rock. And so my dream is to see these changes before I die. So that's my dream. I love it. <laughs> well, I'm really excited for Fluidity Love, and I'm excited to see where it's going to grow, because what you've done with Rebel Mouse is really impressive. Thank you. So Thank Fluidity, you so much. Yeah, it's going to be an awesome platform. And I had one other question, which was, are you guys going to raise again? Well, um, I keep on saying you guys. I'm sorry. Ooh, I just no, it's totally too. fine. Oh. I'm a, I'm Mexican. I I can. You're, it's totally fine. I also hate the plural of people in English. I use guys all the time. We need a better plural in English. I'm hoping we don't have to raise, because I've learned a lot in raising. We've raised 23 million for mm -hmm. Rebel Mouse, and it did allow us to build a platform that is really deep and the engineering work on it, I'm just so proud of. But I think that we can, I, wherever for entrepreneurs, for those of you who are thinking about doing it, if you can skip investors and bootstrap it, that is, that, for me, that is better. Mm -hmm. And you build, there were a lot of things I waited to build and put in place because I had VC money. And that now, you know, in the end, a company should make more money than it spends pretty quickly on its life. And the entrepreneurs who bootstrap are in a way better position for that. Um, we raised some money with the Soul Cycle event that happened on Friday, which was really fun and really exciting. And it's allowed us to begin to pay non-binary and gender fluid creators. Uh, already we have a Patreon account and Andrea at fluidity.love, email me and we're funding creators. We're also working on the certification program. So if you work in HR or if you know somebody working in diversity marketing, there's really cool things we can do together. Um, so I think we can pull it off without raising and, um, and so um, fingers crossed. But we'll see, it's really exciting how people are reacting. It is. I'm really excited. So, uh, yeah, thank you for being on the show and thank you for taking the time to meet. Thank you for having me. Bye, guys. Bye. Oh, see you guys again. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bye, people. Bye, humans. Bye, lovely oh. humans. Thanks for tuning into the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Dream Nation Love. It's not Dream Nation Podcast, it's Dream Nation Love because I think my single mission in life is to teach people how to love a little bit more and together we can save the world. So it's Dream Nation Love, share it with your friends, have a great day and go out and make the world a better place.